first question. You better pack a strap. That's the first lesson. Hard times. It was around 2009 when I started noticing that pop culture was glorifying the lifestyle of gangbangers. It seemed like it was everywhere. The messages that young men were getting about how they should shape their perception of women, how they looked at themselves, you know, you're not important unless you play a sport or you're a rapper or you carry a gun. To get an education, you need a 40 cal cuz. My name is Thelma Strait, and I'm a teacher, author, and mother of three. My own son had just turned 13, and I knew that the statistics were already stacked heavily against black teenage boys. One in three African-American males was expected to end up in prison in his lifetime. The leading cause of death among young black men? Homicide. And the city I lived in at the time, Jacksonville, had the highest murder rate in Florida 10 years in a row. My own brother was shot and killed when he was just 16. Devastated my whole family. And each of us found different ways to numb the pain. I wanted to help the next generation of black men walk a less treacherous path. I got an oral history grant and set out to find a diverse group of kids. Some lived in high crime neighborhoods. Several had a parent in prison. All of them were at risk for peer pressure. Now you might not get to go on every interview. Sometimes I pair you with somebody who I think might be able to teach you a particular lesson that I think you need to witness. Then with parental consent, we hit the road, armed only with a tape recorder, and the hope that their lives might change. Okay, we're way behind schedule. A lot of the boys didn't have a father figure. You know, they had nobody to talk to about issues that they were facing. I chose black men from all walks of life, all over the country. Some of the interviews were part of a StoryCorps initiative. The boys interviewed a Tuskegee Airman who'd been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. The first black sheriff elected in Florida since Reconstruction. There are some risk in being a first. You got to get it right. There was a former football player turned international opera star. and a former Air Force hero turned civil rights pioneer. There wasn't very much that could frighten me until I crossed over into Mississippi. They talked with recovering addicts and former felons. How many times in your life have you ever been arrested? Oh, wow, man. I probably can't count the times. I robbed people, I shot people, I've gunned people down. I mean, dismembering people losing limbs and stuff like that. That was some crazy stuff to hear back then, finally talking to someone who had done stuff like that. We go flashing everywhere that we go, ice cold, but the chain still rocky road. Raymond was a student of mine. He had a lot of anger management issues. I didn't tolerate a lot of crap from anyone here. Raymond had been arrested and put in an intervention program for first offenders. Let's get rid of all the fake people in our lives. Let's get rid of all the bull He would blow up in class. I know he cussed at me and called me the B word. I was definitely angry for a long time. And you ugly, bitch. That's why I wanted him to interview Rodney. And I had became that monster, that beast. It sent me into prison for decades. That really affected me, everything he said. And um, it was really, it was an eye-opener for me. Raymond is now 30 years old. Talking to him just reaffirmed, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't go to jail. I'm not built for jail. The kids who took part in the project are young men now, and they're wrestling with many of the same issues those older men once faced. I wanted to know whether the interviews had made any difference in their lives. Five of them agreed to return to talk about the experience. Jameson was raised by a single mom. His father pretty much didn't have anything to do with Jameson. Growing up, you know, I was into hanging with guys that weren't, you know, making so much of good choices. The crime rate is high. 
and I owned a gun. I had a lot of friends die early just out of my neighborhood. And the crazy thing about it is I kind of like lived in the, in the suburbs. I had no fear. The interview that most stuck out to me was the Alton Yates interview, you know, helping the U.S. get to outer space. I remember he said, Some of our best minds are sitting in prison today. It affected like, man, damn, you know, I better stand up as a, a black man and use my mind. But I realized, like, I don't have to be a, you know, an athlete. I don't have to be a guy that does the other things. I can go out here and, you know, change society, you know, in a different way. I was doing an interview with a recovering drug addict. Oh, which drugs have you done? Uh, which one haven't I done? You'll get a short answer. <laughs> Everything. He reminded me of my grandfather. You know, it's glorified within our community. You know, someone who got an education, they're not as glorified as much as the drug dealer. Robert was at a vulnerable age, and at the time, studies showed that peer pressure discouraged black kids from doing well in school. You have people who look at you as if you're educated and you're not as... As black. Yeah, not as black to them, you know what I'm saying? It started being a thing of, oh, you think you're better than us. The idea that you were trying, trying putting effort in to do well in school was considered a, uh, an offense almost. It's like, why are you doing that? That's my son, Franklin. It often felt like if you were doing the work, getting along with the staff and everything, you were kind of a traitor almost. Franklin used to say he didn't identify as black. It was always weird to me to have people who look like me tell me I'm not like them. I have always kind of felt as a lone wolf. I told myself that I'm brown. But many of the kids felt like they didn't fit into a white world either. Philip lost his home during Hurricane Katrina and ended up at a predominantly white school. That's a different type of bullying. Tripping me while I'm walking through, throwing stuff at me, yeah, that was bad. They outnumbered me, so there's nothing I could really do. Philip was at a turning point back then. He was nearly seven feet tall and black, and he was being pushed towards an obvious career choice. Everywhere I go, you play basketball? You know, how tall are you? So yeah, it was definitely pressure. Philip interviewed Morris Robinson, that former football player who'd followed his talent for opera. You know, it takes a little sacrifice. It's called the road less traveled. I mean, we know that. Did Philip take that advice? Did any of them succumb to peer pressure or the lure of easy money? And there was something else I was curious about. 14 years ago, the kids couldn't relate to the men's stories about racial violence. Two of the men described being attacked by a mob of white supremacists. I ran over to the police officer, and I can remember what he told me, just like it was yesterday. You better get out of here before they kill you. Now they're coming of age in an America that's turning back the clock. Very fine people on both sides. That is scary times we're in. We're really going backwards. A different kind of lynching, yeah. yeah. So I wondered, what if these kids could talk to some of those men again? Could the lessons of the past help keep them from becoming another statistic? I was not political whatsoever. I honestly, back then, I could care less. It wasn't in the forefront of my mind, but now it's always there. It doesn't leave. I cannot care anymore because it can happen to me. Yeah.